everyone. Uh, uh, thank you all for joining us uh, at the uh, NEI Intramural Research Seminar Series. And today we have a, uh, a great speaker. It's a, really an honor to, uh, to have Dr. Peter Sterling here. Uh, Peter is really one of the most influential uh, vision scientists. He's uh, really a deep thinker, always have big picture in mind with provocative ideas and a mentor to me and always seeking wise devices. And he actually played an important role for my choice of coming here to NEI. Um, and traditionally, we have uh, usually a uh, trainee, a postdoc uh, to host the speaker. And today we have a uh, honorary uh, super duper postdoc of NEI, <laughs> Dr. Jeff Diamond from NINDS to uh, introduce Peter. Uh, and uh, just uh, quickly before I hand it over to Jeff, so if you have questions, uh, please uh, type it in the chat box or raise hand at the end of the talk and we will uh, mute you. You can and chat with uh, Peter. Uh, we should have plenty of time for discussion. So uh, Jeff, take it away. Thanks, Wei. As Wei mentioned, I'm a, I'm a senior investigator in NINDS, but sometimes I like to close my eyes and pretend I'm in NEI, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to introduce Peter. Uh, Peter is a professor of neuroscience at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, and also since uh, 2015, a professor of neuroscience at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Um, Peter was born and raised in New York and uh, attended uh, Cornell University as an undergraduate. And then after two years of medical school at NYU, he transferred to Western Reserve University in Cleveland. This was before uh, they merged with the Case Institute of Technology. And there he studied um, the neuroanatomy of the spinal cord uh, with Hans Kuypers. And he did a postdoc after that at Harvard Medical School with Barbara Wickelgren, where he studied uh, the superior colliculus in the cat and the descending control of, of the superior colliculus from the, from the visual cortex. And then in 1969, he moved uh, to the Department of uh, Anatomy at the University of Pennsylvania, where he became a full professor at, in 1980. And at Penn, he cultivated a, a wonderful, rich environment for retinal research uh, together with No Gabardi, Michael Freed, and, and Robert Smith. Now, Peter's work in the retina, um, and particularly in the anatomy of the retina, has honored and I would say dramatically extended the early work of Santiago Ramoni Cajal, and uh, from Cajal made straight the path towards uh, the modern age of connectomics. In fact, well, I'm betting that Peter doesn't prefer, doesn't really like the term connectomics, but I'm going to say that with all due respect to Stephen Polyak and John Dowling, that Peter was the true pioneer of retinal connectomics as it is defined today. The challenge of connectomics, and, and we have one of the best connectomic emissions on the, on the call today in Brian Jones, is to examine and understand neural systems at all levels, from the detailed synaptic connections between each individual neuron uh, to the large scale network structure as it pertains to information processing. Now, in most fields, you could, you could draw an arc between these two levels of analysis, and underneath that arc would be uh, decades of work involving dozens of labs. But, but Peter is always kept these ideas in his mind simultaneously, even before the technology was developed to, to permit more direct sort of, I'll, I'll call it brute force access. And, and you can see this in two of the favorite, my favorite images um, from Peter's papers, and they're behind me. And this first image, I can't do that. Yeah, the first image um, is, is one that he did with Lois Lampson, where he shows uh, the detailed synaptic connectivity to a single rod bipolar cell axon terminal and has identified uh, the, 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 the type of amacrine cell making each contact. And then on this side, he shows beautifully the, the uh, simultaneous convergence and divergence of um, the retinal circuitry of, of the rod pathway. Okay, so th this is the analysis of a similar part of, of the retina uh, at two very different levels. But these two papers appeared less than two years apart. 
Um, and and he's, he's had this ability to, to study the circuit at multiple levels at the same time. I remember the first time I, I visited Peter at, at Penn in the, um, the ancient Department of Anatomy building that I think was designed and built by Ben Franklin. And I sat down next to Peter and he showed me this enormous electron micrograph of Mueller cells uh, uh, surrounding um, photoreceptor synapses. And he asked me, he asked me why I thought this was happening. Now, of course, why is the hardest question to ask in science? And yet Peter pushed for this question throughout his career, and he pushed further in his first book, which he co-authored with Simon Laughlin and is called The Principles of Neural Design. Now, the title of his second book, which he'll discuss today, begins with a what question, but I would, I would argue that it, it maintains this why spirit. Um, the book examines allostasis, which is the process by which a system adapts to stress to optimize energy efficiency. And these ideas have long been evident in Peter's work, and I think particularly of his work regarding um, visually evoked action potentials in retinal ganglion cells. Now, Peter may not know this, but he has played uh, a particularly important role in my scientific development. As a graduate student at UCSF in the 1990s, I had great relationships with several mentors, my, my advisor, Dave Copenhagen, and other faculty members on my thesis committee and so forth. But um, you know, as I read the literature, I, I painted a dramatic kind of mental image in my brain of the rest of the field. And it was a wilderness survive, you know, surrounding the safe walls of graduate school, right? And it was prowled by these you know, intimidating figures like Dowling and Vesla and Miller and Sterling. But I met Peter in person and realized that those intimidating figures were also available to me as, as mentors. And so now, of course, I, I count many colleagues in the field as mentors, but Peter was the first. So Peter has won many awards for his science, his teaching, and his writing, including the Proctor Medal from Arvo, uh, the Boycott Prize, which is a career award in retinal neuroscience, uh, and the Prose Award from the Association of American Publishers. And he put, splits his time now, this sounds really awesome, between Amherst, Massachusetts uh, in the summer and Panama, where he is right now, I, I, I think. No, you're in Amherst. Okay. Um, uh, and um, the title of his talk today is What is Health, Allostasis, and the Evolution of Human Design? So, Peter, it's a real pleasure. Thank you. And Peter, you need to unmute. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you, Wei, for inviting me and arranging this. Thank you, Princess, uh, for making this happen. And Jeff, thank you for this uh, very generous uh, int introduction. Uh, and I would say uh, I have no objection to connectomics. I, I think that's fine. Anything that uh, attracts money is a good idea. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I think I need to share my screen. Can I do that now? Yes, go okay. ahead. And then I will share my video. Uh, and uh, what do I do? Uh, is this? Yeah. Okay. And now um, it's not show. Uh, oops. Can you all see it? Uh, yep. We can see it. Yep. There it is. So. Uh, Let's see. Uh, I have a thing in my screen somehow. That's pain. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, as, J as Jeff said, um, my laboratory focused on fine scale neural, neural circuits, leading ultimately to this, um, to this book with, with Simon Laughlin. And the core point of this book is that. Um, the brain, while being smarter than a supercomputer, super um, uses a hundred thousand fold less uh, energy in space. Whoops. Uh, can't. Yeah. Okay. Uh, less energy in space. And the book explains uh, how this is fostered by, this efficiency is fostered by 10 principles of efficient design. Of course, since the body uses 80% of our total energy, it too must be efficient. 
And, uh, and yet the central concept of physiology, homeostasis, makes no reference at all to efficiency. Uh, homeostasis is supposed to maintain constancy by detecting errors and correcting them like a thermostat. But efficiency requires preventing errors. So the brain predicts needs and regulates physiology and behavior to meet them. Joseph Iyer and I call this allostasis. And, uh, and with Jay Shulkin, I've recently updated the story uh, in, a, uh, in a summary in uh, Trends in Neurosciences. Now, my new book that uh, Jeff mentioned um, considers uh, health in, in, this, in a broader context uh, by asking, um, what does our species require for a healthy life? And can we achieve this uh, by relying on drugs? And since we're constrained for efficiency, why did our ancestors, upon reaching La Cueva de las Manos in southern Argentina 11,000 years ago, uh, immediately uh, look for pigments, ma manufacture pigments and, and tools to spray these uh, gorgeous stencils? So in, in other words, why did our, our brain, our species brain, invest in art? Now, uh, my NIH biosketch uh, and Jeff's introduction explains uh, why I'm, I'm uh, qualified to discuss neural circuits, but uh, art and evolution, maybe not. So, uh, so um, <clears throat> but the thing is, my grasp on these uh, topics emerged from a, a tension between my laboratory studies and my social activism. And so the book and, and this talk uh, reflect substantially how I have lived. So this was my first scientific report. Um, upon submitting it, I left Ithaca for Mississippi to join the Freedom Rides. And in, in this film clip, uh, I was, which I'm gonna show, uh, I was on a train 10 minutes from Jackson, Mississippi, uh, in the, whoops, uh, in the period of the Freedom Rides. So here's the, here's the clue. You? Can you give me any of your feelings on why you want to take part in this? Well, I want to help establish the right of all Americans to eat together and to travel together. Why do you think it's your responsibility? I think it's every American's responsibility. I only think that some are more conscious of their responsibility than others. So uh, 30 minutes later, uh, we were processed. Now, um, <clears throat> The next, uh, I'm in graduate school uh, in Cleveland, as, as, uh, Ohio, as Jeff said, uh, studying the cortical pathways uh, to this spinal cord, brainstem and spinal cord. It's the mid 1960s now uh, at Western Reserve, and I'd slip away from my microscope um, to canvas door to door in, in Central, which was uh, Cleveland's poorest black ghetto. And the people who answered the, the door, my knock, um, were often hemiplegic, limping uh, with a sagging face and slurred speech. And, um, and back in lab, I, I learned that the proximate cause was destruction of these very pathways. This was hemiplegia due to a, a stroke that destroyed these cortical brainstem and spinal cord pathways. Uh, and the cause was uh, chronic hypertension. Now, um, <clears throat> I'd never seen stroke in the white middle-class community where I grew up, north of New York City, but I recalled that before Central was black, it was a Jewish ghetto where my grandfather uh, had been segregated, and he too had suffered hypertension and an early stroke. So maybe hypertension was somehow related to social tension. Fast forward now to my own lab. Uh, oh, sorry, before, as I was writing that summer of 1966, as I was writing my thesis, Cleveland, this Cleveland ghetto exploded in, in riots. Now, uh, fast forward a few years to, uh, to my own lab. And um, I was, I had my own lab, but I was still slipping away, but now to the library, uh, seeking evidence for uh, social, social causes of hypertension and the biological mechanisms. I was also devouring ethnographic studies to learn how other peoples live. And soon I was slipping away to visit indigenous communities 
in Central America. And now, as Jeff mentioned, my wife and I live uh, half of each year um, in a community of subsistence farmers and indigenous workers in the mountains of Western Panama. So uh, here's what I've learned. First, uh, the blood pressures of foragers and horticulturalists, such as this Nobe family, uh, are low and steady with age. This, uh, uh, here's a, uh, this is a typical uh, Nobe, uh, I guess you could call it a cottage, raised off the ground uh, to prevent uh, sleeping with snakes. Uh, here's a woman waving to us as we walk by. This, this is on the Caribbean slope in, in, in the province of Baraguas. Um, and uh, it's two days walk from the nearest market. So people who live like this, uh, including uh, in South America, in Southeast Asia, and in Africa, all have low blood pressures that, are, that don't rise. But in the US, um, blood pressure starts to rise as children enter school. Here's age below, um, here's the uh, 140 millimeters of mercury systolic, uh, and, and above this, you're considered to have uh, uh, be hypertensive. And by, by uh, graduation uh, at age 17 or 18, 25% of children, young people, uh, reach the hypertensive range. Now, the, uh, this reflects sustained uh, uh, physiological arousal. And the rise is steepest for African Americans uh, because they are the most stressed. And the reason is that in the US, black lives still don't matter. So he here's a recording uh, of 24 hours. This is uh, noon, this is uh, midnight, this is noon the next day. And <clears throat> uh, the upper traces are, tra trace is uh, systolic blood pressure, the lower is diastolic. And this is an intra arterial recording from one individual. And what it shows is that blood pressure is not something you have, uh, it's a something that's responsive to each change in mental state, very responsive. So uh, for example, uh, at this point here, the uh, subject is uh, in lecture in the afternoon, uh, early afternoon, and he's dozing, he's relaxed, he's dozing. And then at this point, uh, somebody jabs him with a pin and his brain predicts danger, he wakes up, his blood pressure shoots up, uh, way, way up into the hypertensive range. And then uh, he realizes, looks around, he realizes it's a prank and his blood pressure goes back down, he goes back uh, to dozing. After various fluctuations at midnight here, uh, he becomes sexually aroused. Uh, following sex, uh, his blood pressure falls and he sleeps, uh, it's, it's low all during sleep. And then the next morning at around eight, he's coping to, for the rest of his day and the blood pressure rises. Uh, and it shows a sustained rise. So this is allostasis. Um, the brain recognizes the context, it predicts the need, and it adjusts the pressure to match. And, it and what it does is to provide just enough, just in time. And that's why it's efficient. Note that the system has a wide dynamic range and that it's exquisitely responsive. And this is health, responsiveness. Now, <clears throat> for efficiency, uh, systems adapt to predicted demand. So um, arteries adapt to predicted mean pressure. And uh, in this uh, example that we just saw, the, the, the uh, mean pressure over a long period of time is around 100 millimeters of mercury. And this is, allows the artery, the cross-section of the arteries of the resistance vessels to be modest. Uh, and this is healthy. Uh, if, the, if the blood pressure, uh, uh, predicted blood pressure is, a, uh, is higher around say uh, 160 millimeters of mercury, then the, over time, the, the arteries adapt and the, the uh, smooth muscles of the arteries thicken uh, just as though um, you, your, your biceps would, would uh, thicken to lifting weights. Um, and at this point, your, the, the, uh, the lumen of the blood, blood vessels become partially occluded, and so more pressure is required to, uh, to force the same flow through. 
And in, in a sense, the, the, the arteries become uh, addicted to high pressure. And this is established hypertension. So all, all mechanisms for blood pressure are controlled by the brain. Uh, the brain controls uh, uh, the kidney. It controls the renin secreting cells in the kidney that uh, help determine uh, either retain or spill uh, salt water and determine plasma volume. The brain controls the heart rate and, and, and contractility. And so together, and, and the power, uh, and so the power uh, plus the, the volume determine the cardiac output. The brain, the brain also controls the arterial vessels, it controls their resistance. And the cardiac output uh, pushed through uh, resistance vessels determines, finally determines the, the pressure. So the, the brain also controls, as we know now, salt appetite. So uh, we, it, doctors may tell you, you eat too much salt, but it really isn't correct. Uh, we only eat as much salt as we need. The brain drives our salt appetite so that we take in as much salt as we need to maintain our blood volume. Now, uh, J.P. Uh, Henry, who studied this, uh, these uh, issues experimentally, concluded at, toward the end of his career, he said, uh, psychosocial arousal uh, induces salt appetite, making a society's salt consumption a measure of its social stress. Now, drugs can block these mechanisms, um, but uh, yeah. So a diuretic, for example, uh, will cause the kidney to spill salt water and, and, and lower blood volume. But the brain knows where the pressure it should be. It wants the pressure to be. So uh, it, it speeds up the heart. And you can block the, the heart rate with a drug, beta blocker, and prevent the heart from increasing its rate. But the brain then uh, constricts the arterial vessels, resistance vessels. So uh, you can ult ultimately block that as well with a, another set of drugs. And, uh, but the result, uh, and so you can gain control of the pressure, but now you have a system that can't respond to new, to new predictions. And that is what uh, health is, requires. And that is, what, that is allostasis. So you can block the possibility of responsiveness. And, uh, uh, I, would, I would so uh, the, yeah. Uh, I, I would say that I, I frequently go walking with men my age. A lot of them are on uh, beta blockers, and they do fine uh, for one good reason or another. But when you come to a, a, a slight rise, a hill, uh, they have to slow down. So uh, the other thing is that all of these drugs, and the example here is a beta blocker, affect many. Points wherever there are there are receptors for the for the drug, uh, there are effects. So the beta blocker, in, in addition to uh, slowing the heart, raises blood glucose, and that exacerbates uh, type two diabetes, and uh, 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 which is a problem with hypertension. And uh, of course, you can treat that with more drugs, and those require more drugs. And uh, the result is a uh, basically an ill patient who is uh, precariously stabilized by polypharmacy. Now, um, I'd like to consider a shift years uh, from this low level discussion to some broader issues. Uh, as Jeff sort of warned you, I might. Um, so I'd like to consider some problems with US health. Uh, first, uh, and then I would like to connect these to aspects of our neural design and then discuss briefly what we need to do. The U.S. death rate uh, is rising for all causes for, uh, for white people. Okay, so this is the age-adjusted mortality rate for uh, a particular cohort of middle-aged people around 50 years old. And what you can see is that uh, whoops, uh, for quite a long period, uh, the, the uh, death rates were coming down along with the, the death rates in Europe and Canada and Australia. But about 25 years ago, they started to rise. And they cross all of these uh, other uh, countries. 
the, the, the rise is steepest for um, uh, drugs, alcohol, and suicide. And this is from 1990 to, to basically to 19, I mean, sorry, uh, 2018. And uh, uh, this is just for uh, US whites of, of a middle age uh, cohort, born 1970. The rise uh, is steepest for uh, males, four, five, four fold greater for males with no education beyond high school. And that is about 60% of white males. So, um, yeah, and so uh, the other thing is that this, uh, this problem gets worse for each younger cohort. Okay, so uh, this is age, uh, this is deaths per 100,000 for drug, deaths for drugs, alcohol, and suicide. And the, uh, in the early uh, post-war period, uh, as people got older, there really was no problem with, with despair. Um, and uh, uh, they, people weren't dying of this. But now, look at this. This is the 1970 cohort, people who are now around 50, and they cross the, the uh, they cross this 100, 100 deaths per 100,000 at about age 45. But if you look at uh, the 1980 cohort of people who are now around 40, uh, they're crossing this line of 100, 100 deaths per 100,000 around age 35. We also have obesity rising from food, foods of despair, rich, uh, uh, greasy, fatty foods, and, um, uh, and of course, a lack of exercise. We also have uh, mass shootings, which start around this period and rise steeply over the last um, 20 years. And uh, I call these murders, murders of despair. Um, and th these are, this is a, a despair that gun control will not cure. So, uh, so what causes our collective despair? And here I would like to consider two features of neural design. Uh, first, uh, we evolved this very large brain. The human brain is three and a half times the size of a chimpanzee's, um, which is our nearest uh, living, living relative. Uh, the a chimpanzee can, can forage over six kilometers squared, a human, over uh, a 12,000 kilometers squared. And um, the, uh, this is, but, so this is uh, foraging productivity against age. Here's age, and here's the net production of calories per day for an individual. And uh, this curve is for a chimpanzee. It shows that the chimpanzee is, is born fairly helpless, but by age five, it's feeding itself. And then uh, it, its productivity rises uh, and peaks at about age 15. A human, of course, is born helpless, but and gathers requires more and more calories uh, to grow its synapses and its and its body. And, and by age 15, it's just beginning to do something. And then by uh, age 20, uh, it's just beginning to feed itself. And I, I I like to say, if any of you in the audience have uh, adolescents uh, or uh, young people around 20, uh, you need to have patience. You, can, you must have low expectations because this is the way we are. Having been able, once you humans are able to feed, were able to feed themselves by gathering and hunting, their productivity increased over a 25 year period until their, their middle, late 40s. And then there was a slow decline uh, over, over the next decade or so. And but after, by age, after age 60, they're still producing uh, net producers uh, and helping out the community. So uh, what this means is that for 200,000 years of our species existence, gathering and hunting were challenging careers that required prolonged study and practice. Uh, this is a really tough way to make a living. And that lent meaning to people's lives. The second design issue is that the brain obeys the principle specialize to conserve energy and space. 
Um, this, uh, this is a human brain parceled out by uh, the, uh, one of the brain projects. And what it shows is that we have about uh, 200 specialized cortical uh, circuits per brain. Um, re we reach this limit because the, the skull is full and in reaching the limit, we specialized across brains. So we all have, everyone has about 200 uh, of these specialized areas and circuits, um, but the set for each brain is unique. And so what this does is to confer a unique set of innate abilities. And, uh, uh, and we, pr we practice our innate abilities because that's most rewarding. I, uh, I, I don't, I, studied the trombone when I was a kid, but I, I didn't practice it because I wasn't any good at it and I didn't make any progress. So uh, people who are musicians just pick up an instrument and they get satisfaction and so they work at it. And the same is true for athletics and uh, uh, other, uh, other all sorts of cultural activities. So um, what this does is to pr produce a community of experts, a hunter, a healer, uh, and so on. And of course, this communal intelligence easily outcompetes a design where all brains are the same. So this makes us awesome as a species, but uh, there are costs. And one is mental distress. Uh, we are all strange from each other. We all um, have doubts about ourselves. And uh, you know, this, this is very hard to bear. We also have interpersonal conflict. So, and yet, uh, to benefit from this communal intelligence, we must somehow cohere. And this is achieved, our ability to cohere is achieved by various sacred practices. And that uh, I define as what words alone can, cannot express. So the brain invested in, in costly circuits that go way beyond foraging. Uh, for example, um, they invested, our brain invested in art. And uh, so, uh, we invested in art. This is cave art that appeared, you know, fairly close to the origin of our species. We invested in music also uh, very early. And of course, what was not preserved uh, in, in the fossil record is storytelling and comedy and um, uh, dance and sex. So these all elicit uh, intense emotions of awe, grief, joy, and laughter, and these release tension and foster cooperation. So uh, after 200,000 years, uh, our communal intelligence produced a steam engine. And this steam engine um, uh, that came out just around 17, it was patented in 1769, rapidly expanded uh, industry around it and uh, and it gave rise to the uh, the uh, exponential growth of industry and of uh, atmospheric co2 um, so uh, the other thing that industry did is that it shrank opportunities for challenging activities and this was recognized uh, prophesied really by by adam smith the father of modern economics he was a he was a buddy of uh, of uh, james watt who who patented this machine. And Adam Smith said, the man whose life is spent performing a, a few a simple operations has no occasion to uh, exert his understanding or exercise his invention. And he naturally loses the habit of, of such exertion and becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human creature to become. And that's quite a shocking uh, prophecy, really. Um, but actually, I don't think we've become stupid. Rather, uh, we're still smart, but we've narrowed the possibilities to exercise our innate abilities. We evolved to explore the planet, but now multitudes punch a ticket or scan a barcode. And jobs learned in minutes or days just prevent, present insufficient challenge for our, our magnificent brain. So the mismatch between our abilities and our opportunities to exercise them, that's what causes our despair. So what links our despair to compulsive consumption? 
we inherited from worms, from the first bilateral worm, a circuit that drives seeking for food, for comfort, for the right temperature, pH, uh, for mates. And this circuit uh, rewards an unpredicted find uh, with uh, a pulse of dopamine. And uh, here's an example. This is a, a recording from a single uh, dopamine neuron. Each, each dot is a spike. This is a time trace. These successive traces are all lined up uh, and summed in the histogram uh, above. And they're all uh, synchronized to the arrival of this unexpected reward. And what this shows is the, the arrival of an unpredicted reward uh, elicits an extra burst, burst of spikes, which produces this dopamine pulse. And we experience a pulse of dopamine as, as a brief a pulse of satisfaction, some relief that allows us some peace to stop seeking. So um, as the pulse dissipates, seeking must resume to serve the next need. So foragers find food unpredictably, a root, a rabbit, uh, for each one of these things, they get a pulse. They find comfort unpredictably, uh, a dry cave, a warm fire, and they get a, a pulse of dopamine. So foragers and hunters um, really have uh, a source of uh, frequent small uh, satisfactions, pulses. So, um, we, on the other hand, we find food and, and comfort predictably, without effort or surprise. And uh, this is very convenient, but there's a problem is that predicted rewards provide less dopamine. So here is the same neuron, uh, but the, uh, the traces uh, are, are lined up on a predicted reward. And what you can see is that when the reward is predicted, you get very little uh, extra dopamine. So lacking frequent pulses, we grow restless and anxious. And uh, so when we're dealing with food, when the food is predicted, the main surprise has to be more and richer. Uh, is that, whoop, you okay? Um, so surges, so a, 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 a lot of rich food causes a surge of sugar and fat, and that causes, uh, in, in our bloodstream, and that causes a surge of dopamine. Um, the first surprise is more. If the first surprise is more, the next surprise has to be even more. And that uh, we go from a Mac to a Big Mac to a Whopper. And then we need way more. And the reason is, is that the brain adapts to all surges by reducing its sensitivity. The same story for drugs. Uh, cocaine, uh, al alcohol, nicotine, cocaine, amphetamines, and opioids all uh, evoke surges of dopamine. They act on, on, on various parts of the brain to trigger this surge of dopamine. And uh, then we adapt to it. And so, uh, you know, that is the origin of our uh, various addictions. There are all kinds of other activities gambling, sex, work, uh, all of these things can release dopamine, but we adapt to them and we have to do them more intensively, compulsively. So what to do? Uh, we now treat dis a despairing population uh, of, of which suffers from obesity, type two diabetes, uh, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and addictions. We treat at a molecular level with a whole panoply of drugs. But uh, I, th I think that polypharmacy is not a plausible route to health. Um, it's extremely expensive. And if we could find uh, uh, simpler ways to, to reduce our despair and to reduce our dependence on all of these activities, we wouldn't be arguing, uh, healthcare would be cheaper, and we wouldn't be arguing about how to pay for it. So I would say health requires, first of all, social inclusion. Everybody has to feel that their lives actually matter. By reducing inequality, uh, re we can reduce stress and despair and thus improve health for everybody. Second, uh, by the way, this, this is a terrific book uh, by two British uh, economists and uh, 
there. If you if you type in spirit level on Google, you'll get all access to all of their their uh, very interesting graphs and discussions. Health second requires uh, practicing our gifts across the lifespan. Uh, automation, of course, is progressively reducing the jobs and reducing the quality of jobs. But uh, so we don't need more jobs. Instead, we need challenging activities. Third, health requires expanding sacred practice to relieve the tensions caused by our innate mutual strangeness. Uh, we, we're now click for products of sacred practice, Spotify, Netflix, ESPN, Pornhub. But, um, but vicarious experience uh, cannot substitute for participation. So to conclude, health is responsible you will change. It involves predicting the most likely future needs, and this minimizes errors by predicting uh, and providing enough just in time, and so it's efficient. Allostasis is uh, really the sum of all of these processes that support predictive change. And so if this started earlier in the first uh, bacterial cells, cyanobacteria, evolved a clock that predicts the best time for them to make a DNA, which is at night when the sun, uh, when there's no sun to destroy their, uh, their mutate their genes. Um, and of course, the clock was adopted in, in, uh, in higher animals later and, and is part of our allostatic uh, predictive uh, physiology. The worm brain, um, already uh, was predicting the needs for each organ and learning and teaching the animal where to find uh, resources. So we inherited from these worms this, uh, this ability. Human metabolic and signaling circuits were optimized half a billion years ago. And so now we're tweaking, tweaking them to fix problems that, that really arose pretty much over the last 200 years. And, but I think that uh, drugs that block these ancient signaling pathways reduce responsiveness and, and are not really a, a sensible way to go. Fourth, our, our brain evolved for individualized lives of physical, cognitive, emotional, and spiritual responsiveness, learning across the lifespan. And I think it's our responsibility to live such lives and to help others live them. Thank you. I'd be glad to uh, uh, take questions. Thank you, Peter. That, that's wonderful. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, big ideas and thinkings in there and pro provocative thoughts as, as usual. Um, we, can, we can start to uh, entertain some uh, questions. Uh, audience, uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand or unmute. Oh, we, we can unmute you if you have questions. Is there any question in the chat box? Yes, if you have a question, you can raise First, we have... Oh, Brian, Brian Jones has a question. Where, where, where can I pick up your book, Peter? Maybe, maybe Peter went to pick up a book. No, I, I just... Uh... On the cool box, see how much time I have. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, do you want to uh, chat? Uh, 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 Princess, can we unmute uh, Brian? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Brian, you're on. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey. Uh, where can I, where can we uh, pick up your books, Peter? Amazon. <laughs> Amazon. Okay. Well, done. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, any, any books, you know, any, any bookstore. Okay. Daniel, we have a question. I do. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. That was a phenomenal talk. Thank you for uh, giving that. Um, I wanted to know if there are genetic components that make us uh, more prone to obesity or drug abuse. And uh, furthermore, I wanted to know uh, if you think genetic engineering 
looking at CRISPR-Cas9 um, will help us adapt to our new environment? Um, yeah, so uh, there's a part of this talk at the end that, it, that treats the issue of uh, genetic propensity to any of these things. And I cut it out because it, it was a little more long and complicated, but uh, the, the basic idea is, uh, maybe I should, no, I'll just explain it. Um, many of, all of, every trait we have, basically, uh, which starts with height, which is a very simple, straightforward one, but it would include propensity for addiction and diabetes and, and uh, hypertension. They all have a genetic component. And, uh, you know, in, in the old, in fact, textbooks of physiology now say, well, black people, you know, they have, uh, they have hypertension, but uh, they probably have bad genes and, and, and an appetite for salt. And, you know, that's, that's the problem. And I think, uh, I think actually homeostasis, I'm prepared to say, uh, is really a racist conception of physiological regulation. It just blames the body and it blames genes. The, the thing is, uh, most of these things are multi, now we have these genome-wide studies that show that these traits are, are, are contributed by uh, hundreds and thousands of genes. So I have a, a slide of this uh, basketball player, he's seven foot six, um, and uh, used to play for Utah. And his, his, the reason he had his genes you know, done by a geneticist who was interested in why he was tall. And it turns out he has uh, like 800 genes determining determinants of his height. And he has 200 he's homozygous for that are for tall and none of the same for short. And so, and so his parents were sh tall and, and he was well fed. So uh, uh, he is like three standard deviations out on the height uh, trait. So for all of these other things, the same thing is true for, for intelligence, for uh, hypertension, for uh, susceptibility to alcohol or drugs. There are people, there's a distribution and some people fall necessarily out on the tail and those are the people who suffer the most, you know. So, and also, uh, they particularly suffer if they have had uh, difficulties uh, in, their, in their life. So, uh, sure, there's a genetic component. It's not, uh, it's, for height, it's about, I don't know, 70% or something like that. For most of these traits, it's, it's, it's a good deal less, but there's no need to deny it. But the thing is, uh, this is part of a distribution. You're not going to solve the distribution by, by tweaking one gene or another. Most of these things, the, all the genes that are contributing are mostly small effects. There's a few of somewhat larger effects, but we're not going to solve our social problem that arose 200 years ago by CRISPR. Sorry, it's not going to happen. Uh, we have a question from Will. Uh, uh, Princess, could you unmute, Will? And the question is, with non-stop access to cheap entertainment, to, do you think human brain can retain, uh, uh, so relearn re satisfaction without separation from technology? Yeah, I don't, I don't you know, uh, technology is fine, but it, uh, I think it can get tiresome and, uh, you know, People, there's a lot of people who like to go out in, in the woods and, and, and hike and get a relief from technology. And, and uh, uh, <clears throat> I think, I mean, to be honest, it, it, if you've ever looked uh, at Pornhub, I mean, it's amazing, you know. <laughs> you, you, there's so much that you can watch there and it's for, you know, it's briefly uh, uh, arousing. But after a while, it's, it's a very stereotyped thing and, and all these electronic things are. And, you know, it just, it's not that interesting. You know, you, you need to, people want to be playing their guitars. They want to be hiking. They want to be skiing, not watching somebody ski. And, uh, and same thing for music. You can go to a great concert, but um, so many people would like to actually play, you know, paint. Uh, there's a this question from Peter L. Uh, do you want to answer uh, the question directly? Well, I can read 
for you uh, as meaningful jobs become less prevalent with increased automation and if uh, BUI becomes a reality, what type of activity will become useful? Andy Stern in his book on BUI suggests volunteer activity. What else besides lifetime learning will be useful? What's BUI? UBI. UBI, my bad, sorry. What is it? Uh, Jeff. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what UBI is. I just know it's not BUI. Yeah. <laughs> Universal basic income. Oh, oh thank oh, you, Peter oh, or tutor. tutor. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I, um, I think. Look, it, and John. Let me answer that uh, a little bit by going back. Uh, when I've at some talks, when I show this this curve of the U.S. death rates. Uh, rising and Europe going down, people say, well, well, what does Europe know? And uh, so what Europe knows is uh, that uh, they, they give people four weeks, six weeks paid vacation. And uh, if you can imagine what the U.S. life would be like if everybody had six weeks, four or six weeks of paid vacation, the uh, life on the Beltway, you know, would calm down. People wouldn't be honking at each other, cutting each other off, uh, shooting each other, there would just be a great deal less stress. The same, Europe also has uh, a free childcare, they have free healthcare, they have parks and recreation to a level that we don't even uh, imagine. So uh, it's possible to, uh, to improve uh, the quality of our lives uh, really without, I mean, They've solved this problem. You know, we just have to do the simplest things that that the people in in other civilized, reasonably rich countries are already are doing. So that would be a huge step. The other thing is, sure, we have so much uh, uh, riches now that uh, that we, we could provide everybody with uh, assurance that they wouldn't have to worry about uh, uh, where they're going to sleep. Oh, education too. Higher education is taken care of in Europe. So. Uh, we can provide. We can figure out all kinds of activities to do that uh, would occupy people at various levels, uh, consistent with their own abilities, their own motivation. And if you look at the academic and research communities, uh, if you look around, uh, most most people who are participating and have active stuff that they care about doing um, uh, are not. Uh, obese or, or addicted and so on, because you couldn't, you couldn't do the work. I mean, uh, we go out and get exercise because it sustains us, it allows us to come back and, and, and think or do experiments. So, uh, I, it, you know, I, I can't say, give you a long list, but I, I, a human, I think the evidence from human evolution is, uh, and, and migration is, my God, we, 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 we left Africa 60,000 years ago, we got to Australia, we built boats with stone tools. And when we got to Bali and we were on the beach in Bali, some guys uh, were people were sitting out looking at the Pacific and saying, let's go. Why would you leave Bali? Mm -hmm. Well, because you're and, and, and sail out into the unknown Pacific because we're a species that is curious and exploratory. And so I, I think that is that is deeply uh, embedded in our in our DNA. So I, I'm confident that if we would get beyond the crises that we're in now, this would take care of itself. Now we're Peter, going to Mars. Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Bevel. I just can't find the chat button to push my question. So I wanted to chime in with a question if I can. Can I chime in? Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, Princess, uh, could you unmute Anan? I think he wanted to ask the question. Peter, ahead, I, this, this was a great talk, very thought provoking. I'm glad it's recorded. I'm gonna send it to lots of my students. I do have a question. I mean, a lot of the things you're talking about, I mean, it's the, the impact of stress and so on on welfare, well-documented. It, it sort of, I guess there's a tension between the scale of the problem. So at one level, sure that, you know, the use of drugs just blanketly used in order to control in a kind of reflexive way hypertension, for example, seems problematic. I mean, I think it's unequivocal. It is problematic. On the other hand, 
you know, you're going to get pushback from lots of physicians who say, no, I've got a patient sitting in front of me who has an acute problem uh, or maybe has a genetic predisposition for hypertension that represents the kind of, you know, the three standard deviations away from the mean in terms of the panoply of various genes for controlling hypertension. So maybe the, you know, maybe the problem isn't just the use of these drugs reflexively, but, but really designing smarter ways of figuring out who needs them and when they need them and how to manage that kind of, uh, almost in a holistic sense, the, the, um, the care. And so I'm wondering um, to what extent uh, you know, you pick up that piece, that sort of, it's almost a, you know, I don't know, it's a healthcare management piece uh, in your book. And if you have some thoughts about that. Sure. Well, I, I agree completely. I, I'm not, you know, uh, I'm part of the, the, uh, the NIH establishment. I've been supported by the NIH since I was 22, basically. I, I, I'm not going to bite that hand. But the point is that, and of course, there are people who, uh, for various reasons, get to an acute stage where they, they can benefit from, uh, from taking uh, one drug or another drug. Um, uh, but the question is, right now, we, we've built our lives around these drugs. And, and the idea that, uh, I mean, almost all the papers that come out in, in Cell, I, I mean, I follow all of these journals now, Cell and Neuron and so on, um, they all find a new molecule and they say, well, this will be a good target for obesity. Well, we're not going to solve, I mean, 50% or something or more of, of U.S. population is obese. It's, it's not because uh, they are genetically propensive. It's because they eat all this crap, you know, and uh, they don't move. So we have to reestablish, we have to have uh, physical education. I mean, when I grew up, physical education was giving a a ball to the the good athletes and having them throw it at the bad ones, you know, and, and terror, terrorize them. There was no education. So we, we can teach people skills, physical skills, <clears throat> all kinds of things. And, uh, and the, the, the recommended actually treatment for uh, uncomplicated uh, 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 chronic hypertension is to lose weight and to exercise. Those are the most important things in reducing blood pressure. Then, if, if that isn't enough, depending on the person's age and, and other conditions, you know, you can, you can give a drug or, or so. Uh, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a totally opposed to that, but you can't use that as the main way to, uh, to make a healthy population. Okay, a quick question before I announce uh, from Ethan. Uh, what role does epigenetics play in these uh, allostasis uh, phenomena? Well, uh, you know, that's a very broad question. I, I don't really have a good answer. I mean, we all, I, I recognize the existence of epigenetics, and that, uh, but uh, I, I think epigenetics is basically an environment, a way to convey environmental effects uh, across a generation or two into the genome. And so if we uh, improve our treatment of our, our bodies and our minds, uh, that will be epigenetically received and, and will help move things forward. OK. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Anand, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you are on mute. You can uh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, hi, Peter. This was hi. just a phenomenal talk, a very philosophical, sort of at the boundary of uh, science and philosophy and everything else in between. So I enjoyed it thoroughly. I think your uh, ideas on uh, human adaptation and allostasis are really completely in sync with genetics in, in old. Indian uh, philosophy, we always used to say that you are basically what we call bhagya, means your genes, I would say, karm, which is what you do, and environment, basically. So what you are is really at the, uh, really the merger of genes and environment, and that can uh, basically explain almost all uh, complex traits. Uh, a, a, you know, in fact, and you can, you, you may not be able to change your genes directly, but you can change the impact of those genes 
And some of that could be through AP genome. And this AP genome that was just mentioned just now, it's really in a way form of adaptation. So, so, so I think, I think all, of these, all of these concepts are really not mutually exclusive. They basically are talking about how to explain what we see. The question that I have really for you, so I, I, I really think that this was fantastic. And like Bevel was saying, I'm not going to send to my students who, who should listen to it on their own, but I'm going to send to many of my friends of my age, not in my field, but in other fields who are clinicians and all that. To, 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 and a lot of these wellness clinics and all have come up you know, all over the country. And that's really part of what you are talking about. So it's very exciting. The question I have is, do you think that um, the spirituality and the concept of God uh, is part of this uh, phenomena that we have had during our evolution when we had uh, difficulties in explaining certain things and our tensions were rising or whatever. And this is part of that allostasis that we needed to calm down to reduce the stress and by sort of putting it on uh, something which is beyond us, beyond comprehension, that we were able to sort of say, okay, you know, we don't have any control over it. So I think uh, what I'm trying to see is like Francis Collins has written a book about God and science. And I have sort of thought about it many, many times about how to explain and how to link the two. But your talk to me suggest that this is something uh, which probably may have been in a way part of our allostasis coming back to, 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 to reduce that stress or the kind of things that we see that are beyond our explanation. Uh, thank you, Anand. Uh, you, you uh, there's a lot of point, number of points there uh, that I to the extent I can still remember, I, I, uh, I would try to address. Uh, first of all, thank you for your comments. Um, I would also, uh, I, I'm glad to hear that some people will send this to uh, uh, physicians. One of my uh, concerns is I taught in a medical school for you know, 50 years, and uh, one of my concerns is that physicians should hear something besides homeostasis, which doesn't connect the brain to the body, and, and they should take on this idea that the brain is really dominating our physiology and, and, uh, and that racism is part of that and that homeostasis, yep. just get beyond racism, it, it has to go. So that's one thing. So please do share it with your clinicians. Um, uh, I, I would be very grateful for that. Uh, number two, uh, yeah, uh, spiritu spirituality, uh, and this is in, I discuss this in, in the book, actually, in, in the introduction, uh, which begins with a story about Oliver Sacks. By the way, Oliver, there's a new movie of Oliver Sacks that's just really one, inspiring, and I recommend it. Uh, God, spirituality and, uh, and spiritual and, and sacred practice doesn't necessarily require um, believing in a, in a particular God. Uh, I was raised as an atheist, but when I, uh, when I go into a, uh, uh, a church and I hear the music, I cry, you know. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, yeah, there are all kinds of uh, practices that connect people and that, uh, that uh, touch our, our deep emotion. And part of that is formal uh, religious practice. Uh, the family on our farm is a family of eight, 18 people. When we moved there, there was nine children, but then they've got grandchildren. And so we have this really rather large family living. Uh, uh, it's a Nobe Indian family and they are evangelical Christians. And they sing together, you know, three, four times a week uh, in the evenings. And it's, it's an amazing thing. And it, you can see that sometimes we go and participate. Uh, I've recorded uh, uh, some sessions uh, and they, you can just see that this is something that, that holds them together. Uh, you know, they, they have very specific 
uh, Christian beliefs, but, but that isn't really the, the core thing. Yeah, everybody needs their some sort of uh, practice like that. Yeah, it doesn't have to be any specific uh, uh, God or God's children. It's just a question of really uniting people along a certain belief that could, could help them uh, sort of calm down uh, some of the exactly. daily routine stress and vagaries of life. Exactly. And, and I think that this pr probably emerged with our species along with our, our art and our music. It's all part of it. And yeah. I don't think we could have been successful crossing all of these different environments without that. Thanks, Peter. Thank Thanks, you. Anand. Uh, a quick question uh, from uh, Michael. Uh, how do we get beyond this? And then maybe Sheldon, you can ask. You. That's how a do, big question. How do we get beyond? Well, let's start by voting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> voting, you know, uh, early, you know, I, I won't say often because that's not a good thing. <laughs> uh, well, I, I said to the, the, my pen class, uh, you know, there in Pennsylvania, I said, you know, vote. And they all said, oh, yeah, we voted. I said, well, go out and recruit other people, get them to the polls. We, we need to, uh, you know, we need to attend to these problems. Uh, and most urgently, we need to attend to the climate issues. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this is going to be a, a struggle. But I think this is a period of, I mean, I was uh, pretty deeply upset during the, during the, uh, the spring, all of the, uh, the police killings and watching these things uh, it was so painful. But I think I was encouraged by the, the, the fact that lots of Americans, including whites, got out there and, uh, and are th rethinking things. And in addition to giving this talk on, on what is health, I'm being invited actually to, uh, to give talks about my civil rights experience uh, to children. I've, I talked to a Jewish day school in, in Palo Alto uh, last week. I've, I talked to a, uh, a university class in Panama in my province in, in Spanish <laughs> as best I could. Uh, and uh, uh, I gave a, you know, a little PowerPoint presentation to them. And uh, I think it's a period where people may be willing to rethink uh, broadly how we can, how we can do better as, as a social society. Yeah. Thanks, I, I, Peter. And, and Michael, if you wanted to talk, uh, Princess, maybe you can unmute Michael. And, and, and meanwhile, Sheldon, you want to you want to answer your ask your questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. I really very much appreciated that um, your presentation. Uh, and I, I also was amused to hear that uh, uh, we, we have this, uh, in a way, a kind of significant over overlap in Cleveland on the east side <laughs> and in the suburbs. So, which I experienced both of, and there's many contrasts there to be made. But that's another long story. So, but mainly my, my question has to do with the things that you're touching on now, which, which is the sort of uh, uh, evolutionary power of the family. Um, and that was the, really the basis of my question. And one of the, I, I'm very much interested in developing, having people think about uh, the possible therapeutic interventions, therapeutic interventions that includes the development of extended families uh, across racial boundaries in order to minimize or, 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 or uh, or re minimize, reduce, and remove uh, disparities of all kinds. And I think that is a possible area of satisfaction that could be uh, a sense of well being to everybody involved and all that. So that's really, I wanted to get your views on that. And, uh, and I'm, I'm also very much interested in the, uh, the things that you've uh, already started on and that, that touch on that area. Um, and maybe that's a further conversation because I've been doing the same thing in different dimensions. So um, that's another possible uh, uh, contact. But, um, but just to hear your notions about uh, uh, developing that one aspect as a kind of intervention. Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand. Could you explain a little more about what Sure. Um, um, so the notion, uh, I, I can give it to you in terms of specific examples um, to make it perhaps more clear. And this is a, a, an intervention that's longitudinal and it goes over generations. Um, 
something that I've experienced directly and other people as well. Uh, and it has to do with racial boundaries. Um, so in my case, it had to do with uh, uh, my children uh, who at a very early age from se seventh grade or so uh, brought uh, other children into our family for one reason or another. They stayed with us at various times. There were three, four of them actually, but one of them was black. And that has been a, a 35 year uh, a kind of relationship between the families um, and, uh, and intervened at every single level that you could possibly conceive of. I mean, so now I have grandchildren that are black. So um, uh, as a result of this, and it's, that, so that's, uh, without going into too much detail, uh, you can imagine that um, that has been a, a very uh, helpful, mutually helpful uh, kind of relationship uh, in terms of my interests. And the, the, the question is, can one formalize that uh, in terms of families that are interested in mutually uh, uh, similar ideas uh, and formalize that across uh, and federate it across a whole number of different institutions like some of the ones that you've spoken to. I've been talking to demographers of various kinds and people who have been studying health disparities at, in academic institutions throughout the United States. Uh, and there's some interest there as well. So uh, the question is how to connect all that and and get it to scale. So that's another issue, a longer term issue um, that immediately comes to mind. But it's just the notion itself and how to get it initiated, that, that kind of behavior. Uh, uh, so I was just wondering about your thoughts about that kind of. Uh, well, it, it, sounds, it sounds wonderful. I mean, and I, I mean my principle is, uh, or two, I guess, get everybody together who you can and uh, and I follow, I was only three days behind the late John Lewis getting into Jackson, Mississippi. And I, I, I was trying to catch him all my life and I never did. And uh, he was somebody I admired tremendously. And uh, his, his precept was get into what he called good trouble. You know, uh, I got into a fair amount of trouble in my life uh, um, for talking about these things. And I'm just sort of reflecting on some of them now. And, uh, but I consider it good trouble. And uh, that's what I think we have to do is we have to make right now uh, some good trouble. I, I always admire folks like you, Peter, that uh, have a mugshot. <laughs> but I bet if I got one, I got kicked back to China. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, you have to yeah. use sense. good sense. <laughs> uh, Mike, I, I think you're, you're on mute, you, you, you wanna? Uh, converse with uh, Peter directly. Oops. Michael, are you online? I think uh, Michael might be uh, juggling with. You're uh, mute. Hi, 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 hi. It's really it's not really necessary not because Peter oh, answered Peter the question. Answer the question. Okay. Then Sheldon illustrated it with clear points. Mike, can you turn down your volume? Yeah. Does that help? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I said it's really not necessary uh, because Peter answered the question and Sheldon illustrated it with clear examples. And I'm most grateful to uh, both Peter and Sheldon for that. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh, is there any more questions from the audience? I'm trying to look over the uh, chat box and uh, Tudor. Uh, uh, Princess, could you unmute Tudor? And Lissy has a has a question. Oh, oh, okay, yeah as well. If you could unmute all of them. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So from people that have experienced all this and have been at the front line of all this social struggle, my question seeing this, you know, as a newcomer to the United States is, do you feel that the social segregation in the US has increased or decreased over the years? along ethnic lines, economic lines, whatever lines you can imagine. What, I didn't hear what you said has increased or decreased. The segregation 
of social compartments across all these lines you discussed, economic, ethnic, uh, all sorts of other, uh, if you think religion, etc. Do you feel that there has been progress since the 70s? Has it gone up and down? What do you feel that it looks like? I feel that there's been tremendous progress. I mean, the, the 60s, uh, I spoke to these uh, uh, elementary school students and they said, well, do, do you feel that you made a difference? And uh, the answer is absolutely, because uh, after the 60s uh, movements for, uh, for uh, bus, bu the bus boycott in Montgomery and uh, civil rights and voting rights and stuff like that, there was a tremendous progress of changes in federal law but you know, uh, life, human society is goes two steps forward and one step back. So it's sort of a waltz, and uh, and you have to keep moving forward. But I mean, in my day, the only time you saw blacks was in some menial position. You would never see them on TV. You would never see them in the university. Uh, you know, uh, and now this is this is common. You would never see. Uh, 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 an interracial couple, and now it's common. Nobody, nobody fusses about it too much. And uh, yeah, I, I think there's a tremendous advance, and the you know there's still huge disparities, and there's a you know a huge problem of of the police forces being made up of people who who really uh, aren't prepared to deal with people uh, uh, except by shooting them, you know, and or I, that's an exaggeration. I don't, I don't mean that. But there's, there's way too much reliance on, on violence uh, in, this, in these communities. The real problem is, remaining problem is uh, uh, school segregation, which people had the fantasy <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> in the 60s, we could take care of by busing. Well, uh, it, it didn't work. And the thing is, People need to go, kids need to go to school more or less on the average where they are. And what that means is uh, having the, the core is to, is to have integrated housing and, and uh, racially restricted housing grew up after World War II and it's been promoted, it was promoted by uh, federal uh, loan policies and banking policies and all kinds of things. And that has to break down now and nobody has really paid attention to it uh, for several generations, and now we have to really take a look at that and we have to open up housing so that everybody can live where they want. And, uh, and that, will, that will take care of eventually of, of school segregation. So we just, it's, you know, it's a, it's a very complicated, people are very complicated and this is gonna take a while, but I certainly think we have progress and the progress we've made certainly warrants more effort. Thank you. And a question from the European, Ulysses, go ahead. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, so uh, thank you very much for the talk, Professor Sterling. So I was wondering uh, how this economic system that we are living in is actually affecting the, the delay to, to reach a more fair and, uh, and human-based uh, society. So that that's, was my question. Uh, are you asking if I'm a socialist? No, no, no. I'm just asking if it's. <laughs> I'm just asking if it's. Uh, you were mentioning before, like the European uh, system as a more fair, from for example the um, health healthcare point of view, uh, a more fair system compared to to US. So I was wondering if there is some some issues with the economic system that blocks this kind of transition to a uh, toward a. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering. I, I get it. Well, I think, again, it's complicated. Uh, um, I, I think it's not just our economic system. I mean, uh, at, at the heart, we have, we're a capitalism society, and so are these European societies, so is Japan. Uh, so uh, I would say that uh, capitalism is not uh, the only thing that's standing in the way of living a halfway uh, reasonable life. Uh, I have no objection in principle to people making a profit. It's just that if you push it too hard and you make that the only thing, uh, everything else 
goes to hell. And we can't, we can have capitalism, but we have to have a green capitalism. We can't, we can't do this to the environment anymore. Look at that, that rise in CO2 is like an action potential. You know, you guys are in the NINDS. Uh, action potentials have to repolarize, you know. Uh, we, we can't do this. So, um, so I think the answer is we have to get some control over, over the, uh, our economic behavior and, and to have it be a little, a little fairer. This book, The Spirit Level, uh, I recommend because it shows a huge range of countries with various ranges of, of inequality. And uh, the U.S. is the most unequal way by far, and it's got the most of these problems of death rates and all kinds of deaths of despair, mental illness, and so on. And what I think it requires is people in this country realizing that we could, if we want to make America great again, we should make it as great at least as, as these reasonable European countries and Japan and, and so on. And, and that doesn't Hello? It doesn't require a revolution. It just requires, you know, thinking a little bit more clearly about what our values, what we're going to do. Thank you very so, much. So along the way, Peter, do you think the, the society or government op operates in a way that in line with the uh, allostasis idea or to, to deviating from it now? Um, hmm. Well, I don't, yeah. Uh, you want to spell that out a little bit? The point being that this, this, the society or government uh, uh, sort of predict or optimize the, uh, the, the energy or resource in this case uh, in a predictive way, adaptive way, or we're kind of a, as you said, action potential <laughs> shoots yes. off. Yes, I think it needs to. I think it has been only, it's been operating far too much on feedback, on, uh, on error-correcting feedback. We make this error, we change something. No, I think we, we have the intelligence, we have the computational power, we have the, you know, if we had the will to plan something reasonable, I mean, I mean, just look at the pandemic. We, we know what to do. I mean, it's just obvious what to do uh, uh, just by wearing a mask, you know, uh, good old Tony on my book. Uh, uh, so yeah, we could do a much better job of predicting what the need is and taking the, the most reasonable, simple steps to achieve it. This is not, this is not rocket science, you know. Uh, Thanks. Uh, we uh, maybe taking a, a, a last question from Brittany. You want to go ahead and ask, ask, ask the question? Hey, hello. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, great talk. This is very thought provoking. And uh, I'm currently involved in a lot of uh, extracurricular kind of STEM mentoring programs for low income communities in Maryland. And one of the biggest issues students are concerned about is simply finding a passion both academically and in their personal interests. I remember uh, earlier in the talk you mentioned that pursuing personal interests and academic interests is one of the key ways to reduce overall uh, life despair and reducing stress. Um, so what do you think are some short-term high-impact ways we can talk to today's high school students to um, foster passion and decrease this overall life despair that many of them are feeling? Uh, well, that's a great question. Uh, you know, um, I would say, first of all, uh, I would ask them what, what their interests are and help them explore to things to find their interests. I, I would also say that uh, I think the practice of having herding students, 30, 40, 50 students into a classroom and making them sit still uh, for hours at a time, uh, in, you know, in normal circumstances, forgetting the current pandemic, uh, is about the worst possible thing you can do. Because what you're doing is you're taking uh, young homo sapiens, which have this broad distribution of talents and skills, and you're telling them that none of those talents and skills uh, has any meaning. They just have to learn this stuff. And some of them learn it very easily and uh, quickly. And so it's like athletics for me. I mean, I never got any athletic education. And the people who may be good athletes, but not so quick uh, to, to, uh, to learn to read, are ignored and, and, and uh, badly treated. So I think we really could do well by uh, 
stopping this classroom one size fits all, making pretending that everybody can pay attention for an hour. My, I, I couldn't do it. My son couldn't do it. Uh, and uh, my son was always in trouble in class uh, because he, he, he wasn't, when, when people have ADHD, which is like 20% of many classrooms of boys, they're, they're given drugs, you know, for AD, so-called a brain disorder. It's not a brain disorder. It's some part of the distribution that where the, the, the voice that's in the student's head is their own voice. It's not the t they're not listening to the teacher because they're listening to something in their own head. So that was my son. And he went on to be a comedy writer because that's what he was, he was thinking of funny things, you know? Uh, so I think we need to find out what is in the heads of our young people and, and help them find ways to work on that. Another point is that, uh, which is in my book, is that um, uh, in, in earlier societies, children learned a lot from each other. And on our farm, there's, you know, any moment there's 10 kids of a range in ages from, from nursing infants up to, you know, uh, high school, college age kids. And they're all taking care of each other and they're all playing together and, uh, uh, and they're learning from each other instead of being crowded in an age, uh, homogeneous age group where they get into fights and, uh, and where nobody attends to, to their abilities or their interests. So, so we have to do a, we really have to revise our educational uh, practice. Thanks, Peter. I think I experienced firsthand through my early education in China that uh, uh, one rule fits all and sit still type of education. Uh, maybe one last, last question from Tiziana. Go ahead. Yes, hello. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the inspiring talk and the discussion. Um, so my question is, how would you envision a scientist uh, advocating for a better or a different kind of society based more on, uh, based on the evidence that some of the values of justice and equality may also have a foundation in the way our brains are wired. So a bit suggestive that um, you know, the common uh, uh, betterment is actually better for the individual, for example. Um, uh, so the particular question, can I, what is the question? The question is how can a scientist, how would you envision a scientist advocating for um, changes and or um, the better society um, based on the principles that the, the way we're, our brains are wired um, do justify, uh, do support the uh, sort of um, searching for uh, justice and equality? Well, I mean, ways? yeah. Uh, uh, big question. Uh, I don't really, you know, I've been so focused on just getting my, the facts straight and assembling these arguments and writing them down uh, halfway clearly and interestingly. And uh, so uh, I haven't really thought about um, how to organize society to spread the ideas. Uh, in fact, I, I had a fantasy when I published this book, well, uh, I'll get on NPR and uh, uh, fresh air and I'll talk you know, publicly about this, it'll be great. Well, that, that my publisher and my teacher said, you know, it's not gonna happen. This is not a, this is a book that's too difficult for the general public, this is not gonna happen. And so uh, what I decided to do was uh, just to try to give talks uh, to my people, uh, the, the, uh, the, the community. I went up uh, in at last February, beginning of February, I went to, uh, to UCLA, I gave a talk there, and then I went to UC Davis and UCSF and Stanford and Washington. And just as I finished my talk in Portland with uh, Enrique van Gerstorf, uh, COVID burst on the scene and, and then we're back to, uh, to doing these Zooms, which is pretty effective actually. Uh, I've talked to Johns Hopkins and Lehigh and you guys, and I'm gonna keep doing it. So, and I feel like I'm meeting, uh, I'm trying, and the University of Pennsylvania, by the way, School of Medicine has yet to acknowledge my book, uh, has not invited me for a talk, has not mentioned it on any of their publicity. And I tried to, uh, to uh, urge the first year, uh, uh, the 
educational program to have students read it? No, that, no, we couldn't do that. So uh, my strategy is just to, uh, to deal with one talk at a time, a few students at a time, and uh, I hope to cross at least into the medical community and, and I'm finding little ways here and there. Whenever I see a new thing on, on Twitter, I tweet, retweet it and I'm, I'm just working uh, sort of on my own and you guys uh, have to figure out how to, I mean, I uh, bring these issues to the attention of, of the society, of, of uh, various scientific societies and uh, get, them, get them on the docket. Uh, if somebody in Society for Neuroscience invited me to give a talk, I, I'd do it. You know? But I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I'm running out of time, so you guys are gonna have to pick up the torch. And uh, I feel that the book at least is a, uh, is a document that you can, uh, you can use and wave in somebody's face and say, you know, it's all here. <laughs> well, we, we can talk to the clinician. I think we can just replace the first part of your talk, uh, hypertension with uh, glaucoma and pretty much everything fits, right? The, wow. uh, the, uh, the pressure and how, how it changes and even the circadian component of it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so that was, that was great. Uh, maybe one short comments from uh, Brian says, uh, Steve, uh, uh, Superman's uh, NeuroTribe book is great in talking about neurodiversity. Uh, uh, well, with that, I, I guess uh, we, we, we could end our uh, today's seminar. And thank you, Peter, again, for a wonderful talk, really uh, thought provocative. We, we, we spent almost half the time uh, discussion on uh, uh, different uh, subject. And uh, uh, I think uh, it's it, it achieved the goal. I was tasked to uh, add uh, uh, speakers uh, dealing with uh, public health issue. And, uh, and, and it, this, what you talk about can't be more timely here uh, with uh, discussion about uh, science and health and social equality. And, and so it's just wonderful. Thank you very much, Peter. We really well, appreciate it. Thank you for, it's so good to see you all again, Jeff and, and Ray, and, and uh, uh, very glad to be here. And, and thank you again. I, I, I enjoyed it a lot. So take thank care. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Thank Bye. you, Jeff, for the thank nice you, introduction. Thanks, Jeff. Bye-bye. Yeah.